Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the five common mistakes that we see in management buyout transactions. And just as a quick background, my firm Robley Capital is a Canadian investment bank focused on selling lower mid-market private businesses. And so I've been through a few uh, MBOs in the past. And this comes from my experience, also hearing some of the horror stories that I've heard in the industry when it comes to MBOs. So let's just get into it. So at a high level, an MBO is when a group of employee managers buy out the existing ownership group and transition from employees of that business to shareholders and owners of that business. And the challenge with that is that when you're pursuing an MBO, there's the internal disruption and the dynamic that changes when you're trying to negotiate with your coworkers and your boss. That itself is a very unique situation. And so it's really important to have clear rules around communication, having advisors in the room to mediate when things get a little bit more tense. And then ultimately, the risk is if, say, for example, one side takes a more aggressive stance or one side doesn't agree with a certain approach and all of a sudden, you know, they lock horns. Well, there, that internal trust between management and ownership can be hurt, which ultimately lowers the value of that business because now all of a sudden the people that are running that business may not be as happy or as motivated to push the business forward. So the challenge usually in MBOs is that, the employees understand the operation side usually or understand some portion of the operations, but they don't have that exposure to the ownership lifestyle and understanding how to own a business and how to think through the strategic side. And so typically there's a financial and knowledge gap that needs to be bridged. And usually that requires more patience from the seller in terms of staying on for longer or, you know, planning ahead to transition those roles, to transition that knowledge to the management team so that you can obviously reduce the transition risk when you actually pursue the MBO. So let's dive into the five common mistakes, and then we can go through some of the planning and solutions to each of those five mistakes. So the, so the first one is you pursue a management buyout too soon, and you start working on an MBO with an inexperienced management team. So it's really important to have a pretty frank discussion as a seller when you think about selling to management. And the two key questions to ask are, A, are they financially ready from a management and skill set perspective to think through the financial decisions required to operate a business, how to manage customers and suppliers, collections, how to talk to the bank, how to read a monthly P&L, all of these different things that you know obviously are natural to a business owner when they're responsible for the money. But now you're transitioning that to the management team. Have they had that exposure? Are they able or are they a little nervous or completely unaware of how to manage the financial aspect of the business? And then the second side is the operation, operational readiness. And this relates to the ability to transition key functions of the business. And so usually when a management team is going to go to the bank or to the investors to raise money to pursue and finance that MBO, investors are going to ask, you know, who is managing the key functions of the business? So sales and marketing, finance, product development, people management. So if the key managers that are going to take controlling ownership of that business are not involved in that today, and the owner is still doing that, well, the question is, well, what's going to happen after the deal closes? Is the owner going to stay around? Are you going to take take over the owner's role? Who's going to take over your role that you're doing today? You know, these transition, operational transition questions are important. So naturally, the ideal is to com be completely out of the business as the owner and that the entire management team is running the day-to-day -day business and so that there is no operational transition risk. But that usually isn't the case with smaller businesses. The owner may still be doing 40% of the key ownership role of selling and managing onboarding of customers and pricing new work and all that kind of stuff. And and even though the, the general manager or the team of employees are handling all other 60% of the business, that 40% still needs to be transitioned. And so the question is, are they ready to transition that 40%? So again, the common mistake here is that you don't really do this analysis up front and you're not really planning ahead to focus both on financial and operational readiness. So naturally, the solution to this is simply to focus on transitioning these roles earlier on in the process. So from a financial perspective, you know, what we've seen successful MBOs do is that they, they 
several years in advance are already opening up the financial books to the management team or to the key manager and showing them how to read a PL, how to think through talking to the banks and speaking to the accountants, preparing the tax filings and the year end working papers. All of these things that you know seem mundane or very, very foreign to an operations manager that's never thought about the financial aspect of the business will ease them into that early on. Because if you throw them in in the middle of the transaction, well, A, they will they will have a very hard time raising money from investors or gaining the confidence of the bank to finance that deal without obviously you staying on and maintaining that financial stewardship. So delegating that down to the management team is important early on. In addition, what you can do is you can hire a part-time external CFO to be that internal mediator or that internal financial resource so that in a worst case scenario, if you get hit by a bus, the operations manager is still learning the financial aspect but doesn't really have a strong hold, there's already a CFO or part-time CFO in place that can bridge that knowledge gap from a financial readiness perspective. And so sometimes this is what we see. You know, if an owner really wants to exit quickly and they sell through a management buyout, the general manager still doesn't have a really good grasp. They bring in an external CFO to be that, you know, tool in the manager's toolkit so that they can still teach the manager as they're getting familiar with ownership. And then the last thing that they can do, and this is what I've seen done very successfully, is if you're thinking in five to 10 year increments about selling your business through an MBO, you can also sell a piece of the business to the manager early on in the process and get them familiar with being a minority shareholder. You know, the rules and the regulations of being a shareholder in a corporation, you know, thinking through taxes and dividends and getting them comfortable with reading the year end statements and cooperating and understanding what the bank wants, what the accountants wants, what the IRS or the CRA wants, all of these different things that again are usually foreign to the GM. Now, from an operational readiness perspective, it's very simply a transition planning discussion. And so early on, prior to actually going through the process, it would be important to detail and highlight an organizational chart and simply say, what does the management or the key employee do versus what does the owner still do in the business? And then really focus on how can that owner step back from the business quickly to reduce the transition risk and allow the business to run without the seller. And so that usually may take a few years, it may take another key hire, it may take some grooming in the middle management so that you know the general manager has a number two that they can bring up and partner together to transition the ownership. But it's important to have these discussions early on because you know I've seen situations where the general manager is really good at product, they're an engineer, they're really, really good on the manufacturing side, but they can't sell. So do you expect them that all of a sudden the seller is going to step back who is the key salesperson in that business and now they're going to have to sell for the entire company? It's not going to work. They're not going to be able to develop those sales skills. So it's important to groom a junior sales advisor to come up in the ranks to fill that role that the seller is doing today. Because in certain instances, a general manager or a key employee may not be able to do what the owner is doing today. And so it's important to find all of the tools required to transition the business. So moving on to the second mistake, unrealistic business valuation is a common issue that draws out deals and, and, and really kills potential MBO transactions because both sides disagree on valuation and then ultimately you waste a few months and then you know the seller decides, screw it, I'm going to go and sell to a third-party buyer. So unrealistic business valuation comes from both sides. It could be the seller's unrealistic view Or it could also be the management's unrealistic view. And what I commonly see is actually, funny enough, it's management, the buy side. So usually an external buyer doesn't know what they know, right? You know, they're externally looking in. They're going to be naturally a little optimistic about buying a business and being able to grow it. Whereas the management team, they're inside the business today. And so they know all the skeletons in the closet. They know everything that's going on in the business. And that usually influences their perspective on value. And so naturally, when you know too much about a business, you are a little bit more hesitant to be optimistic, to be more aggressive, to be bullish on the outlook because, oh, you know, hey, like we've been struggling with these customers and these customers are a pain in the ass and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, all you're nitpicking at this, the quality of that business as the internal management team and you actually lower your perspective of value. And so that's what we commonly see. The management team usually lowballs the seller. 
thinking that, oh, this business isn't worth that. Like, I know this business better than any other buyer, and I believe it to be this. But the problem with that is that they're not really understanding the market approach to valuation, which really looks at the financial aspect of profitability, a multiple of EBITDA, looking at the financial value of the balance sheet, and not looking at the more operational nitpicky issues, but really the financial value of this business. And so, you know, to mitigate this risk, the very first thing to do is to educate the management team on helping them understand how M&A buyers think through deals. Because right now, most management teams, when they're thinking about an MBO, they've never bought a business before. So they're going to think about it as a manager buying the business, whereas their competition is professional buyers, private equity competitors that frequently buy businesses and have a different approach to valuing that business. So it's important to focus on getting them on even ground so they don't lowball the seller. Now, the opposite end is that from a seller's point of view, they may not have a really good understanding of what the business is worth. And what's really, really common is that the seller is going to say, well, you put an offer in and they don't even set a price to the management team. So they let the management team, who's naturally conservative, set the price on the business. And that commonly results in a low offer. The seller internally knows it's worth way more and they're very, very big gap. So from a seller's point of view, the first thing they should do is focus on setting the price tag themselves. Don't let the management team set the price tag. Let them know what the, your target is. And typically, that's done by getting a valuator in place, getting a business valuation, getting market feedback from investment bankers, and really feeling out what the business is worth. And then set that reasonable valuation, give it to the management team, and let them reach it. The mistake that we usually see is that sellers don't do that. They don't spend the time up front to understand what the business is worth. They internally think it's maybe worth way more than it actually is. And they're asking for 10 times EBITDA when it's actually only worth five times. Or they don't even want to give a number and they let the management team figure it out themselves. And that naturally results in wasted time around negotiation, low bids, big differences in bids, and it just really drags out the process. So I've already kind of alluded to the solutions. The first, from a seller's point of view, is set, you know, go get a CBV, a certified business valuator, uh, to appraise the business, talk to investment bankers and MA advisors to get their feedback on what the business is worth. Encourage the management team from the, from the buyer's point of view to go get their own counsel, to maybe speak to an MA advisor so that they can get educated and comfortable with how businesses are appraised, how valuation multiples work. And then set a clear price point from the seller's point of view for the management team. Don't let the management bid blindly. And ultimately, there's no clear rule. In some instances, MBOs will result in a higher sale price. In other instances, you may not get the maximum value through an MBO. It all depends. And so from a seller's point of view, you know, you don't want to figure that out while you're pursuing an MBO. You want to figure that out before you go to the management team and say, hey, I want you guys to buy me out. And so to do that, you should go to an M&A advisor and, and run both options and scenarios and understand, hey, if I sell to management, what am I going to get? What is the structure going to look like? And then you go and you say, hey, if I sell to a third-party buyer, private equity firm, uh, you know, what do I get from those guys? And it went, compare those options and then figure out what you want because – you shouldn't be figuring this out in the middle of the process because all of a sudden you're going to create a ton of disruption, waste a ton of people's time, and it's just disruptive to the business overall, which ultimately hurts your business. Because if management tried to buy the business, failed to buy the business, the post of that is that all of a sudden they may not be committed, may not want to work with the new buyer, and you may have a tougher time selling that business to a third-party buyer once you've opened the MBO door. So don't open the MBO door, first have those discussions. Now, mistake number three is that some sellers believe the deal is going to be the same. And I've already kind of gone into this already here in saying that, you know, when you're going, you're evaluating your options, you know, an MBO transaction will most instances be different than if you sell to a third party buyer. And it's not only price. It could be different variables. So the best way to think, talk about this is to look at the two types of buyers. So there's the external and the professional buyer that, you know, really, you know, they've bought businesses before. They're, they're very quick to move. And, you know, that's really their approach. And then there's the management team. So what we typically see on external deals is the timeline to close is much shorter 
than if you were to pursue an MBO. So it may take a lot less time to get an offer from a professional buyer, especially if you're organized, and their timing to close, to raise money, to do the due diligence on the business. They've done this before. They're going to move fast. So typically, an average external buyer sale may take nine months. Conversely, we've seen MBOs drag out and you know take 12, 18, 24 months to close, and it's a you know multi, multi-year process. But in general, I would say if you want a quicker deal, going with an external buyer makes sense compared to the management team. Naturally, these professional buyers have their own equity funds. They're usually a little bit more well-off than the management team. They already have the experience in transitioning the business. So from you as a seller being required to stay on and teach the, you know, the new owner how to run the business, usually the transition time is much different for an external buyer than an MBO. And also the tone of the conversation is a little bit more direct. You know, at the end of the day, you can go to a buyer, an external buyer and say, I want this price, take it or leave it. But if you go to the management team and you take a firm, aggressive stance, you know, that can really harm that internal relationship and trust. So it's a little bit more softer you know, your discussion with the management team versus external buyers. Now, conversely, when you look at the management team as a buyer, you know, they typically require more time because they have, they have the, they don't have the experience to have, to have acquired a business, to have pursued a transaction. They need more time to prepare, to have those discussions with the bankers, with their family members, to really line up the funds to pursue and submit an offer. From a financing perspective, it may take a few more months or you know longer to raise the funds, to convince lenders to really back them. And so naturally, professional buyers are going to be quicker to raise money to close a deal than the management team. And from a transition perspective, the owner is maybe still involved in the operations, but the role is going to be a lot different than an external buyer. With an external buyer, the transition time may be one year usually. Uh, you know, data dump, and they kind of give all the information to the buyer to get comfortable with the business. But usually experienced buyers have transitioned businesses before they know what to look out for, and the rest they'll figure out by themselves. Whereas with the management team, it's that paternal relationship between, you know, you're the owner of that business, and you're giving the keys to the castle to this management team. And so you feel this sense of responsibility to stay more involved. So ultimately, we do see that sellers are a lot more involved in MBOs post sale than if they were to sell to an external buyer. So naturally, when you know going through these bullet points, the key question for you, you know, thinking about this, is what do you want? You know, that's the key question. If you want a quick deal, you don't want to worry about, oh, is the buyer going to fall through? You know, they have the funds. You know, I want a quick and smooth transition. In most instances, going the external buyer route makes more sense. But if there is a softer side, to the ownership and the decision to sell, to sell. There's a reason why you want to sell to management, you know, to reward them for their loyalty because you want to kind of help them out in their ability to generate wealth. Then, you know, it's not pure financial and timing. There's a, there is another emotional element to choosing to work with management, but it's important. It's very important to understand that there's a very big difference between the two. And so understand that the way the deal is going to unfold, the type of deal you're going to get is going to be very different between the two. Okay. So when you look at the planning solutions, I would say if you're going to pursue an MBO and ultimately you still want to retire within the same timeline, you know, give yourself more time the MBO route versus if you wanted to do a quick sale with a third party buyer. So, you know, a third party buyer may need a year, you know, you may go through a year of a sale process, and that typically takes nine to 12 months to sell to a third party, and then another year to transition the business. But if you wanted to sell through an MBO, maybe give yourself an extra four or five years, where in that first year, you know, you're educating them, you're kind of transitioning, you know, roles, but you haven't really put pen to paper on selling the business. And then you kind of phase them in, maybe through a minority buy-in first. Or, you know, you sell the business, but you stay on and you're a key figure in the business still. Now, from a financing perspective, in most MBO transactions, we do see the vendor financing is a higher percentage in an MBO versus an external buyer. External buyers, the general market standard nowadays is up to about 25% of the deal comes through a VTB. 
Whereas we've seen MBOs where it's 20 to 40%, I've seen sometimes 50% of the transaction is financed through seller financing, and the bank comes in and maybe the, the management team has like 5 or 10% equity to put into the deal. But traditionally, managers don't have that liquid net worth to finance a big portion of the deal. So they need more help from the seller to really bridge that gap. From a financing perspective, professional buyers understand how to manage le leverage businesses. They understand how to borrow more from the bank. So we typically see financial investors borrowing 60 to 80 percent of the transaction price in, in, in uh, senior bank debt. Now, conversely, really good MBOs, you don't want to put too much leverage on the books because, again, this is the first time they're managing the P&L of the business as the owners of the business. So managing a leveraged P&L is very difficult because you have to really be lean and manage cost creep. So it's better to put less debt on the books, carry more vendor financing as the seller so that the overall transition risk is reduced. And then lastly, you know, this is just a very key point in general, you want to compartmentalize your relationship as boss and employee and as buyer and seller so that, you know, when you're having deal discussions, you know, it's maybe it's in an office or it's off premises, it's not in front of other employees, or it may be simply flowing through mediators, uh, investment bankers and your buy side and sell side support so that, you know, it doesn't get too awkward because naturally, as I said here, one of the key points is, you know, with an external buyer, you can be a lot more aggressive and say, this is what I want and you got to meet it. Whereas if you do that with the management team, it tends to put a lot of strain on your relationship, which on the nine to five portion of your day, when you're actually running the day to day business with that manager, it can get really awkward. So mistake number four is trying to sell the business to external buyers while also pursuing an MBO. So this, I've seen this in two instances. In both instances, it was a terrible decision. Just absolutely did not help the situation at all. So if you're thinking about selling through an MBO, you know, make sure that you pursue that option first before you open up discussions with external buyers. Because the reality is, if you're attempting to create a competition and pit your management team against the external buyers, all it's going to do is going to create friction it's going to, you know, your manager is going to be pretty disgruntled and they're going to feel hurt because all of a sudden here's the boss and is saying, yeah, you know, you could buy the business. Oh, but you have to deal with these 50 other buyers in an auction process. Good luck. And here's this team that's never bought a business before that needs more time and needs that transition support that the seller is not willing to give. So in most instances, when you're trying to sell a business, if you're pitting the two, a management team versus external buyers, it will create a lot of damage to the internal business. And so if the goal is to pursue maximum value for the business, sometimes skipping the MBO option is best altogether. The reality is, as I kind of went in the last slide, you may not get the best deal from a structure perspective. The buyers, you, the external buyers are usually going to get more financing than the management team. And so ultimately, you know, they're willing to pay more for the business. So if it's purely a financial decision to say, I want the top dollar for my business, the MBO may not be the best option for you. But if there are other emotional reasons behind pursuing an MBO or there's a strategic niche that, you know, it's just there's not a lot, a lot of external buyers available for the business, then the MBO may be the best option for you. And so in that situation, it's really important to open the MBO door, give them enough time to pursue. And if they are able to strike a deal, then great. But if they're unable to strike a deal, then you then move on to the external buyers. From the external buyer perspective, and I've, if I've heard buyers say this, you know, if buyers are aware that they're competing against management, that also creates a level of uncertainty for them. Because think about it, if I'm an external buyer and I want to buy this business and the team that comes with it, but I actually find out that that team is trying to buy the business as well and sees me as competition, well, can I trust them? Are they going to run this business well while we're going through this process? Are they going to intentionally hurt the value of the business to help their own interests out? When we are in the management teams and we're talking about the business and how to transition and they're trying to sh impart that knowledge on me, are they holding something back? Are they trying to trip me up as, a, as the competition in the process? Ultimately, most buyers, if they're competing against management, will bow out of the process because they just don't want to compete with management. So, 
The reality is, if you're in an auction process, the managers have a ton of value to add or extract from that from that from that process. So it's really important not to create them as competition to external buyers. The best thing from your perspective is to avoid that altogether. Okay. So how do you do that? The first is once again, you want to confirm what the value of the business is and have a very frank discussion with your family, with yourself to say, you know, if I'm going to get top dollar externally, does an MBO even make sense to pursue? If it does, then the very, very important thing to do is open the MBO door first. Don't open, don't pursue an open auction with third party buyers, but give your management team a deadline and say, hey guys, I want to put the business on the market. But I also think that you guys could buy this business and run it yourself. And I'd like to see you guys buy it. I'm going to give you a deadline. In the next three to four months, give them a certain time frame in which they have a chance to put together a bid. And if within that time frame they're unable to, then very clearly say, you know, at that point in the process, I will then open up the, the sale process to external buyers. And so... I'll give you a really good example. So the, we were working with a service-based business where the key director of the business that was running the business was offered the chance to buy the business, okay? So the manager, the seller of the business said, hey, you know, I'm interested in selling to you. The director said, yeah, you know, absolutely. My husband and I, we want to put together a bid. You know, we're going to go to the banks and have a conversation. You know, months go by. We get involved. We, we go to sell the business to the open market and we find out that the director still thinks that they have the time to put a bid together, that they're in the midst of doing due diligence and talking to family members and raising funds and all that kind of stuff. And they all of a sudden find out that the business is actually being sold to external buyers now. And obviously they feel lack of trust, they feel hurt, and they actually ultimately quit in the middle of the sale process. So the seller gets screwed because all of a sudden their key employee left in the middle of the process and the value of the business declined. And from the director's point of view, here they were spending months and months to put together a bid and they thought that you know they had an in, that they were going to put in a bid and there was no communication. There was no clear structure to say, hey, you have three, four, five months to do this. But after that, you know, I have to go. I have to go and sell this business because I have to retire. Like I only have a certain amount of time. So it's really important if you open that door, set a clear timeline and say you have until X days to bid. At that point in time, I will move on. And that way, you know, they, they're not taking their sweet time. They're much, they move much quicker. They formalize a bid and they put it in quickly. And if they're unable to get a bid together in three to four months, they probably don't have the skill set anyways to run a business. So it just really kind of clears that option altogether. But that was a really perfect example where they probably could have put together a bid, but they thought they had all the time in the world. And it was the seller's responsibility to communicate to them that, hey, listen, in 18 months, I want to retire. So I'll give you four months or I'll give you six months. But that last 12 months, I need to go to market and sell this business because I need to retire. And they didn't do that. So that's the best way to really manage the expectation and hold them accountable to that deadline. Now, the last mistake I've seen is selling to a misaligned group of employees. So a really key question is, who are you actually selling the business to in an MBO? Are you selling it to one president, general manager, or are you selling to a group of employees, you know, director of sales, director of marketing, director of product, uh, you know, CFO, and, you know, maybe like the COO. So the key question is, who are you selling to? Because ultimately, the larger the group of employees in that management biotransaction, the greater the complexity of the deal, and the more parties need to agree on key decisions, right? What are we paying for the business? How much money are we putting in? You know, who's ultimately the key leader of the group? All of these are key questions that need to get sorted out. And so the larger the bio group from an MBO perspective, the more complex it is. So usually, I always say, try to sell to a smaller group just to keep it simple. And ideally, you want to sell it to maybe the COO or the general manager or the key employee. In, and that usually is the case with the smaller businesses. But naturally, as the businesses get larger, there may be divisional heads that have their own expertise and manage their own businesses. And so they may get together. There may be a, man, a team of five managers that are buying this business. But ultimately, when there is a larger group, you as the seller need to hold them accountable 
and ask of them to ask very key and important decision this uh, questions. And from the management team, you need to figure these questions out before you finally decide who is going to buy, who's in, who's buying the business, and who isn't. The first is, and it's a very simple one: who's the leader of this group? You know, you can't have five co-CEOs if you're if there are five managers buying this business. There's still going to have to be someone that is responsible for you know the buck stops with that person. So you know that may be the COO or the general manager, and then there may be VPs that come in. But in that instance, are we all equal partners? Because if we're equal partners in a percentage terms from a share share ownership perspective, but you're the big boss, that creates a complexity. So typically, we see in multi group scenarios, the big big leader of that group usually owns the most and the largest share of equity. And the smaller shareholders are, you know, VPs and are, you know, still in a way reporting to that, you know, leader of the group, but they're also owners in the business. Now, another question is, what about age? What about expectations of ownership? Say, for example, you have three, three shareholders thinking about buying that business, three managers. One's 30, one's 50, one's 70. Well, that seven-year-old manager may have a ton of experience, but may only have five years left of working life for them. The 30-year-old may have 40 years of work life and is, has different expectations of how the business should be run. So it's important to get in a room and, and talk it out up front and decide what do you want. You know, that 30-year-old you know, says, hey, listen, I want to continue to work here, but I don't need the dividends today. I want to reinvest the money so we can grow the business quicker. Whereas the seven-year-old is going to say, hold on a second, I don't have many years left to live and I want to enjoy the benefits of ownership. So I want to draw more dividends out of the business. So that all of a sudden creates an imbalance in terms of how money is used after you own the business. So have those discussions up front so that you know there's a very clear plan and so that they all of a sudden don't create an inter internal infighting between the group. Because from the seller's point of view, if you're selling to a group, they buy that that business from you. They're, as I said, most likely going to own a large owe a large vendor note to you. They're responsible to pay that VTB back to you. And if all of a sudden they're infighting amongst themselves and they can't get aligned in how to run the business, that could hurt the business post sale, and that would still hurt the seller. So even from the seller's point of view, you have a sense of responsibility to hold them accountable to these questions. What is your thinking? And maybe you even sit in a room and prompt these questions to them and give those questions to them to sort out and let them answer them for you so that you can get comfortable because you have a right to ask these questions, especially if you're going to hold back seller financing on that deal. Now, it's really important you know, to also decide shareholder agreement, you know, how, how are we giving, you know, certain veto rights, say, for example, you know, the, the, the minority shareholders in the MBO transaction, what do they have a say in? Do they have a say in anything? Do they need to have a say in something? Or they're still junior in the company and don't have the experience to really sit, have have veto power in today's, you know, environment. So all of these questions are really important. Misalignment, creates higher transition risk, which is a lose-lose from both perspective. For the buyer, all of a sudden you're buying a business and you're fighting amongst yourselves. From the seller, you know, you may be selling a business, but you still are owed money and you don't want that buyer to be fighting amongst themselves. So the best thing to do in terms of mitigating this mistake is number one, identify the leader of the group and focus on coaching them to really be the leader and to, you know, obviously get the group in line. And usually you want, as a seller, to really impart wisdom to that key leader to say, hey, listen, if you're going to have five of you buy this business, talk it out, understand your expectations, and really focus on transitioning. Say, for example, one wants to leave four years down the line. How do you buy out that person? Do you have enough money to buy out that person? Or is there an agreement that in the first five years, no one can sell their equity in that business? You know, have those discussions today. You know, as well, it's important. Some managers are idealistic and they may say, hey, you know what? We want to bring in everyone, you know, get 20 people into this management pile because we need the money. We don't have the money. We need more equity funds. So bring in the production manager, bring in, you know, the, the you know, AVP of sales and blah, blah, blah. The reality is the more people, the more complexity. So coach that manager and tell them to really focus on who is 
in the inner circle? Who really should be an owner and who should just stay as an employee? Because at the end of the day, if you're just bringing in employees for the sake of raising the amount of equity funds you can get in the deal, that is very, very short-sighted. Sure, it helps in bridging the financing gap today, but it just adds a ton of complexity around trying to herd multiple expectations and opinions of shareholders. That's why I would say max, especially for a small business like sub $10 million in size, max five people, like even five is a lot, like three maybe. But, you know, once you get to like a billion dollar company, you're doing a management buyout, maybe then, you know, you bring in 15 or 20 people. But if you have 20 minority shareholders in an MBO, uh, you know, buyer group, and you're a $10 million company, that's way too many people. That's, you know, it, it shouldn't be that much, right? You know, you st- st- they're still, especially with small business, you need to make decisions fast. And competition is quick. So you're hindering yourself from being able to run that business if you're bringing in a ton of people. And then lastly, it's important to bring in a legal counsel early on to maybe they're the mediator of these questions. You as a seller, coach the group to say, hey, listen, you should have these tough discussions. Bring in the lawyer and and let them de- spell out that shareholder agreement. And there are tons and tons of different you know shareholder agreements and wordings that can be included to limit certain things so that people are aligned contractually from how they use their equity, how they uh, function and act as shareholders. Maybe there's a rule where there's no dividends for the first three years to allow for reinvestment, but after the three years, dividends are allowed. And all of a sudden, the young person is like, great, I get three years of reinvestment, but they can't say anything after the three years because you put pen to paper on that deal. That's what you agree to. So, you know, putting things in writing is critical, and that should be done with the advice of a lawyer in the room. So this is another really key mistake, and this is something that, you know, people forget about. You know, it's nice to think, and, and, you know, this idealistic point of view to bring in all these people and everyone becomes an owner, but the reality is from a functionality and business decision-making process, it may actually burden the company and hurt the business overall. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. You know, I really went into a lot of detail, but I just, I really love MBOs. I think that they can be done right they can be a really successful transaction structure for both the seller to get value out of the business, but also impart a wealth generating vehicle on the employee group. And at the same time, from the employee's point of view, here they have the chance to buy in to a business to generate and accelerate their wealth generation capabilities, which is just, you know, it's awesome to see. But at the same time, it's a very delicate process. And if it's not handled correctly, you can ultimately hurt everyone in the process. The business's value gets dragged through the mud. The seller loses out on the wealth that they built over many, many years. And, you know, the internal trust is, is, is damaged. And maybe that management team breaks up and leaves the company, which no one wants to see. So if you have any questions, please do reach out over LinkedIn or, you know, through my website, or just comment below, and I can follow up. And we can really get into the details and specifics of this. But if you found the video helpful, please do like and subscribe to the channel for more content. And I really appreciate you guys watching this video. Have a great day.